I'm not against gay people. Okay, I love them. They're great folks. But Schiff looks like the archetype archetypal cocksucker with those little deer in the headlight eyes and all his stuff. And there's something about this fairy hopping around, bossing everybody around, trying to intimidate people like me and you. I want to tell Congressman Schiff and all the rest of them, hey, listen, asshole, quit saying Roger and I, and I, don't, I, I never used cussing in 22 years, but uh, the gloves are off. Listen, you son of a bitch. What the fuck's your problem? You want to sit here and say that I'm a goddamn fucking Russian? You get in my face with that, I'll beat your goddamn ass, you son of a bitch. You piece of shit. You fucking goddamn yeah. fucker. Listen, fuckhead. You have fucking crossed the line. Get that through your goddamn fucking head. Stop pushing your shit. You're the people that have fucked this country over and gang raped the shit out of it and lost an election. So stop shooting your mouth off claiming I'm the enemy. You got that, you goddamn son of a bitch? Fill your hand. I'm sorry, but I'm done. You start calling me a foreign agent. Those are fucking fighting words. Excuse me. There's a great video out there by Pig Puncher who, side note, I genuinely thought chose his screen name as a commentary on anti-police violence before I realised that it was a Minecraft reference, which posits that the reason the right dominates so much of online discourse, particularly on YouTube, is simply due to the fact that they're able to shovel out awful, poorly thought out takes on various news sources and vague controversies every day without doing even a moment of research other than finding articles to clip pictures of and literally just read out whilst their avatar kind of just chills out in the corner, whereas typically leftists tend to put more research into their videos. He uses the examples of no bullshit and contrapoints, pointing out the huge disparity between them in terms of talent, quality and effort being put into the content, and comes to the conclusion that the YouTube algorithm rewards regular uploads and seemingly punishes nuance and care put into content. This is, of course, borne out in reality, even excluding the evidence that this video took me several weeks to make, especially in light of the uh, election stuff I had to out at such short notice, hence why a lot of the news articles are no longer, well, news, there should really be no way someone like Sargon, who spends basically zero time doing research or expending effort into making his videos, should be close to a million subscribers, while someone like Sean is on just over a quarter of that. But YouTube, much like capitalism, is not a meritocracy and so the ignorant, unresearched bullshit rises to the top. For my part, I've been doing my best to try and churn a lot of content out in a short period of time to try and combat the rights hijacking of the algorithm, but it doesn't seem to have worked out all that well, and a couple of times I've ended up both rushing videos and also really pushed myself to mental exhaustion, trying to do so while simultaneously maintaining a full-time job and moving house, so I'm slowing down a little now, as you've probably noticed. Or maybe not, you know, considering once again <laughs> the election stuff. The basic format of the leftists are taking over media and making everyone dumb genre video, which, let's be honest here, is what it is. It's a semi-comedic take on the cultural Marxism meme without the unfortunate connotations, plus a side helping of owning the libs and posting a slightly more intellectual take on the SJW feminist cringe compilation number 159 or whatever. These videos are invaluable in the indoctrination of the youth into accepting more and more far-right ideologies, a key step in what American Johnson defined as the PewDiePie pipeline, which can be seen incredibly clearly with the recent controversy PewDiePie found himself in and support he received from Nazis. Otherwise known as the algorithmic way watching certain types of videos can lead one to slowly go from teenage edgelord watching gaming videos to full-on alt-writer within a few short years. The videos themselves aren't anything to write home about and aren't on the level of PragerU or the Iconoclast, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm pretending that Sargon whining about some bullshit news story is the same as the Iconoclast saying that the globalist elite are trying to control the media to eradicate white men or some shit, unless Sargon lets the mask slip, which he does sometimes. See, look, look, this is what I mean about the chat, I just can't be bothered to deal with people who treat me like this it's, it's really annoying like i you are acting like a bunch of niggers just so you know you you act like white niggers look you carry on but don't expect me to then have a debate with one of your faggots then why would i bother <laughs> like why would i bother you act like enough class title now maybe you're just acting like a nigger mate have you considered that do you think white people act like this white people are meant to be polite and respectful to one another and you guys can't even act like white people, it's really, like, 
amazing to me. But they exist on the same pipeline, just at different points on it. Someone like Gavin McInnes or the Iconoclast are more towards the extreme end, but in order for them to get to that point, the creators earlier on in the pipeline have to do their jobs as well, as even Richard Spencer acknowledged. Allow me to explain. Let's say some snotty little oik of a teenager watches PewDiePie because, well, edgy video game boy is the most popular YouTuber out there for a reason. He, and it is usually a he, noticed that Pewds makes a lot of edgy jokes and sometimes gives shoutouts to people like Jordan Peterson or sometimes out and out Nazis and complains a lot about whiny feminists. Then, thanks to the algorithm, he starts seeing videos with titles like Jordan Peterson destroys feminists and then maybe some Ben Shapiro and feminists get wrecked compilations and he starts to think, hey, hey, yeah, feminists are so fucking dumb, but also, maybe their ideology is dangerous as well. This is where these daily outrage videos come in. They take the feminists get wrecked cringe video compilation formula and translate it into a more outwardly respectable format. No longer is our teenage edgelord just laughing at an elderly man shout at a college student and calling it the marketplace of ideas. Now they can pretend they're engaging with ideas and arguments being presented, and the sheer volume of these serves to perpetuate the the myth of the SJWs as powerful and dangerous. After all, if they weren't, how could all these videos talking about them exist? These news stories prove the hegemony of the SJW menace that must be fought against. It's at this point that the algorithm might suggest some more of these videos, and since they come out daily this may take some time to get through. Maybe a few other Sargon videos, thus continuing the slow progress towards eventual far-right hate crimes. This progression is not guaranteed, of course. In fact, most people lose interest in that sort of content when they grow up or else just remain at a certain point on the pipeline and never go further, but it can and does happen. The Christchurch shooter cited multiple YouTubers in his manifesto, or at the very least the talking points they like to peddle. This is just a brief overview of the subject, I'd love to go into more detail, but it's not really relevant. And unlike a right-wing outrage merchant, I don't see the point in making the exact same video as someone else for clicks, so for more in-depth analysis, I would suggest checking out non-competes and three arrows videos on the subject, both of which are illuminating and terrifying. As mentioned, no bullshit is the king of this genre, if you want to call it that, but of course, it's the sort of grift that all right-wingers love to jump on without a second thought. Sargon has this week and stupid, Computing Forever has how is this a thing, and so on and so forth. These three are probably the most prominent, or at least among the most prominent, so I'll be taking a look at them individually to see how they hold up and to demonstrate just how easy it is to saturate the YouTube sphere with misinformation, and how hard it is to correct the record. I'll be taking a look at a few videos today and hopefully demonstrating the transparency and unfortunate effectiveness of this tactic. Right, first up is Sargon. Fresh from his humiliating defeat in the EU elections and impressive ability to cause not just online weirdos like us, but almost everyone in the UK to read about his antics and go, what a twat. <laughs> To start, Sargon has a bit of a moan about how Silicon Valley is censoring him and encourage his followers to follow him on far-right, oh, sorry, I mean free speech friendly platforms. Now Patreon banned him for being a bit of a bellend, by which I mean massive racist wankstain. Before I get on with this video, don't forget to follow me on Telegram and on BitChute. Links will be in the description. These are non-Silicon Valley platforms where we'll be at least guaranteed a presence for a lot longer than we can be guaranteed with the ones in Silicon Valley. He finishes this out by stating that one day everyone you like will be on there because they'll have been censored off of other platforms. Do it, it's definitely going to be worth your time because one day that's where you're probably going to have to find everyone that you enjoy following on YouTube. Which, I mean, says a lot about the sort of people Sargon and his followers like to support rather than tech billionaires. What, so, like, completely innocuous Let's Players are going to be on there as well, are they? Patreon's going to ban Vsauce, are they? Right, sure, mate, whatever. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. You are acting like a bunch of niggers. He then talks about the epidemic of knife crime sweeping London, mostly black-on-black -black violence, and says shit like this. Back in February this year, fatal stabbings in London reached their highest levels since the Second World War. This has been something of a concern for people living in London because it seems to have been done by ethnic minority inner city youths. The problem got so bad that it was more dangerous in London than New York. Everyone knows that this is young black men stabbing one another in London, in the inner cities, in ghettos. 
ignoring the provable fact that London doesn't have ghettos in the same way that they exist in, for example, the USA, there are rougher areas and safe areas which, of course, almost perfectly correlate with where working class people live and where rich people live, even though most of the time it's the same local councils and governments making all the decisions. For example, I used to live in a relatively posh area of my town, where basically everything I could have wanted or needed was within walking distance, and most of my neighbours were relatively well off, and would even have the balls to put vote Tory signs in their windows without being concerned about someone potentially putting a brick through said windows. Now, however, I live in a much more working class area. It's significantly more difficult, and most notably, the roads and pavements are in severe disrepair. I've started cycling to work now, and it's honestly depressing how many potholes I have to avoid on my journey, which simply were not there when walking or taking the bus from my old house to work. The councils simply do not care about areas which are mostly populated by lower income individuals, even when the needs of those individuals may be similar or even greater. This is not an isolated incident, in fact a quick Google search shows up results like this, and all of a sudden it's easier to start to see why poor areas, which thanks to systemic racism and entrenched class system, are disproportionately majority black, might start to seem more like ghettos than they actually are. I could harp on about this point for ages, but it's not any of the racist garbage Sargon wants to go on about that causes this problem, it's the class system itself and entrenched prejudices caused by it. Or does he think shit like this is pure coincidence? He then goes off on one on one of his favourite talking points, the black fathers are bad and that is the sole reason for black crime one, which he tried to bring up with Destiny back when Destiny was good, only for it to be completely dismantled. And of course, because this is off the cuff and not really well prepared or tightly scripted, doesn't provide any evidence. We, we know, like I said, we know if they get married, they're not going to be in poverty. Yes. Right? So, so why wouldn't all of them just get married now, then? Okay, yeah, well that's the- I have the answer for you, but you're okay. not gonna like it. It's the welfare state. <laughs> okay. And that, that's not coming from me, that's coming from a black professor of economics. Okay. I, I don't so, think that that is an agreed upon thing by all economists. So how is- how does the welfare state do it? Well, it- basically, most people stay in marriages because they have to. What, what do you- what? What, what, why Most, do people get married? Because it's advantageous for them to do so. Sure. And as soon as as soon as there is an option that is maybe not a great option, but it's obviously not a terrible option, um, well, they there are large portions of people who take it. Okay. How does the welfare state? I'm sorry. One more time. So how does the welfare state keep black people from getting married? Well, it incentivizes them to not need to get married. Why? Because financially they can get by without. I mean, I think that anybody could get by financially without getting married, though. I mean, mm, if you look at divorce, three kids, three different fathers. I I guess I'm I'm not connecting the, I'm I'm not well, connecting, okay. how, how the marriage how getting married impacts any of these things. Okay, well, get, getting married is without a doubt one of the best things you can do in your life financially. Wait. Why? I don't know if I that's know. true. I don't think that's oh, true. No, it's absolutely true. The statistics absolutely bear oh, no, whoa, 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 But you're putting the cart before the horse. Wealthy people tend to get married. That doesn't mean that becoming We're married makes wealthy you wealthy people. people. Where it appears that some kind of gang warfare is taking place. Which is why Stormzy wears a Union Jack stab vest at Glastonbury. As a protest against this going on. But the thing is, the police don't know what to do about it. What are they supposed to do about it? Well, I mean, we can't tell the truth about it, can we? When Ron Little says, well, you know what, half of black children in the UK don't live with their father, and we wonder why they're dying, I hate to say it, but he's got a fucking point, isn't he? He's not wrong. It is probably the consequence of fatherlessness that young men, black in this case, but it would be the same for any race in my opinion, Go looking for authority figures in the form of street gangs and older men who are dealing drugs and whatnot, who give them a sense of belonging and inclusion and structure in their life. He then accuses this writer in the Huffington Post, who is a woman and therefore cannot possibly speak to the experiences of black men, where Sargon, a white man, absolutely can for some reason, of denying the truth. Now, of course, the Huffington Post, for some reason, can't agree that that's the case. I don't know why they have a problem understanding this. And I noticed that this was written by a woman. Now, I don't mean to single out women and say, look, you don't understand young men, 
But as a man who was once a young man, I'm telling you, you don't understand young men. Okay? You don't know why this is happening. But all the men are saying, well, it looks like this is a consequence of fatherlessness because they remember themselves. They remember themselves when they were young adolescent boys. When they're coming into their manhood and they realize that they're strong and they're energetic and they can do things, but they don't know what to do. That all men know, even though I would argue that a majority of men have no fucking clue and very few have actually done the slightest bit of research into the topic. Sargon definitely hasn't. But he just says it with confidence as if it's a fact and I guess that's basically the same thing as doing research anyway. And that's the role of the father, to give instruction, instruction and guidance to the young man as he becomes an adult so he can become a responsible man who is something, someone productive, something useful in the world and not someone who joins a gang and starts stabbing people up in the middle of fucking London. In the middle of the day, these stabbings have been fucking awful. Absolutely awful. Okay, so if this were true, first off, all children of lesbian mothers would be equally as delinquent as those from single families, for which there is literally zero evidence. But also, I remember being a kid, and to be frank, this role doesn't have to be carried out by a father. Nothing he said here is gender-specific in any way. Again, he blames the entire crime spree on one potential factor, doesn't give any evidence, and just quotes news stories of individual crimes, whilst definitively stating that he and he alone is aware of the real reasons behind the crisis. And it's, the left I think is really encouraging this, right? And it's people like Sadiq Khan. I do everything in my power to cut, stop and search. Why? Because it's racist. Oh, really, Sadiq, back in 2015. Fast forward three years and after this spike in murders, so Sadiq Khan's going to significantly increase stop and search in London now. Or oh, Sadiq, you're a fucking racist, aren't you, buddy? You're a goddamn racist. If you think that that's going to do the job of cutting crime and not being a racist at the same time, you're wrong. By your standards, you are a racist. He calls Sadiq Khan a hypocrite over his U-turn on stop and search laws, but leaves out the fact that most of this crime wave has been allowed to happen, or at least has been exacerbated by Tory cuts to police budgets and local youth centres, not to mention calls Khan a leftist, which just goes to show how little he understands leftism. Oh, and also Theresa May, the Conservative Prime Minister who was Home Secretary at the time, oversaw some of the most awful racist right-wing policies in decades, and yet also stated that stop and search laws were being overused, and she was literally the person in charge of the police. And don't forget, really quite right wing. But of course Sargon doesn't mention this. But anyway, that was all background to the I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, absolutely hilarious decision by the current Conservative government. And I don't think I'm gonna be able to get through this next part without laughing, so I'll try and edit out most of that. But you'll have to forgive me because the memes are coming to life. Chicken takeaway boxes warn young people of knife crime danger. Really? Young people. Knife crimes. Dangerous. Chicken. Chicken boxes featuring warnings about the dangers of carrying a knife have been sent to takeaways in England and Wales as part of a government campaign. More than 321,000 boxes will replace standard packaging outlets including Chicken Cottage, Dixie Chicken and Morley's, the Home Office has said. Real life stories of young people who's chose, who chose positive activities over carrying a weapon are printed inside the boxes. Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott said the plan was crude and offensive. Well, if it's offensive, we probably shouldn't do it. Just like stop and search, Diane. And just as Sadiq Khan found out, Reality doesn't give a shit if you're offended. So, yes, the Conservative government literally made the cartoonishly simple connection that a lot of inner-city black youths were being violent, and black people like fried chicken, right? They may as well have set up a fucking watermelon stand. And all of this is in lieu of actually giving funding to causes and organisations that might be able to help, like youth centres and outreach programmes which had their budgets slashed and services gutted by Tory councils. But, yes, in Sargon's mind, this is just a pragmatic facts-over-feeling situation and not a a flimsy excuse to paper over the crisis caused by the current government and a neat little distraction from the fucking disaster that is Boris Johnson's prime ministership and of course the Brexit mess. However, medieval warlord Pretty Patel defended the campaign. <laughs> of course she did, she's pretty great. Well, at least the Conservatives are trying something. Unlike the usual leftist race agitators whose solution is to do nothing. 
Has anyone asked David Lammy how he feels about this yet? Actually, most leftists' ideas are to do more community outreach, providing help to those that need it and helping provide stability to poor youths' otherwise unstable lives. But Sargon thinks that Sadiq Khan is a communist now, so I guess he wouldn't care what actual leftists think. Is this some kind of joke? Why have you chosen chicken shops? What's next? Knife-free watermelons? <laughs> I'm just saying they know the demographics, David. The statistics are in. The memes have come true. So, yeah, Sargon is just laughing with the conservatives being racist because he agrees with them and is also a racist. What else is new? I know it might cost a bit more time and effort, but I would love it if you would announce a program of investment in our local communities instead of f spending five minutes on a harmful gimmick. The thing is, David, right, we can't make people get married. We can't force them to do so, right? And here Sargon completely ignores the, like, actual point here. He leaves the tweet up and ignores the point completely because he's convinced himself that family is staying together no matter what is how we stop crimes and is refusing to listen to any detractors. So we have to now try and find a way of persuading the kids, hey, actually, I know you don't have fathers in your lives to instruct you on how to live as a real person, as a, as a, a self-actualized grown adult man. Why does this role have to be filled by a man? What can a father teach a young boy about the world that a woman can't? Genuinely, I know I'll probably have a few chuds watch this video. Some of you, please leave your answers in the comment section. I'm genuinely curious. What about being a man necessarily has to be taught by a man? Shaving, wanking, cultivating an unhealthy attitude towards women and an inferiority complex about being perceived as unmanly for shit like going down on your partner? Looking at you, DJ Khaled. I believe a woman should um praise the man, you know, the king. You know, if you, if you hold it down for the... For your woman, I feel like the woman should praise, and and the man should praise the queen. But you know, my way of praising is called, huh, <laughs> how was dinner? Um, you like the house you're living in? You like all them clothes you're getting? I'm taking care of your family. I'm taking care of my family. You know, putting in the work. So you saying like, you don't go down? Nah, never. All of that to say you don't go down? Come Can on, I you don't eat the box. Come nah, on, my Khaled. Oh, 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 you don't eat no box. Nah, I thought that's what nah. hold you down was about. Nah, well, I don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, never I, in life, or did nah, you try it and didn't nah, like the taste? I, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't. Not even like for her birthday. Nah, listen. Christmas. She get. She get. She get Jeez, Khaled. I put in that work. My my work is great. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do my well, thing. So now if she told you she don't do that, is that okay? I'm not. Nah, it's not okay. Because, <laughs> because you know what I'm saying? At the I'm end confused. Of, so because, You got to understand, I'm the dawn. I'm the king. You know what I'm saying? And she's Everybody's the queen. the king of the house. Huh? She's the queen. Of course. So? I don't do that. Yeah. It's not fair. It's different rules for men. You know what I'm saying? You know, you got to understand, like, you know, we, we, um, we, we you know, we the king. You know what I'm saying? So, we you know, there's some things that y'all might not want to do or want to do. It got to get done. You know what I'm saying? I just can't do what you want me to do. <laughs> I just can't. Okay. But f step one, don't start stabbing each other. That's step one. Don't resort to tribal warfare using gangs and territory around London as some way of settling disputes. So now we have the racially charged references to tribalism. Presumably, of course, this doesn't include nationalism because fighting over areas of a city is bad and a result of bad upbringing, but fighting over parts of the world is good and actually a great demonstration of the rights and freedoms of the West and the generosity of the imperial nations in sharing this freedom with the third world. David, something you called out in 2012 before you got really woke, I guess. Even if Lamy agrees with the absentee father's angle, I would thoroughly disagree with him, but that doesn't invalidate this point. This tweet doesn't even bring up the fatherlessness issue, merely pointing out that this is an ineffective, offensively stereotyped way of solving the problem, and that there are much better solutions out there. And again, I notice that saying investment in our local communities isn't actually a fucking suggestion. That doesn't solve anything. If Sargon had actually bothered to put some effort into making this video, he would have seen that actually it does have a meaning, as, once again, a quick Google search for the phrase investment in communities shows. Community investment is in the building and maintaining of good quality affordable homes and through the vast range of community programs which respond to local needs and help build resilient communities. AKA stuff like youth centres and engagement with young people as opposed to just leaving them alone to suffer in silence. I thought Sargon 
Sargon cared about the well-being of men in our society, or is that just when he wants to use the suffering of men as a stick with which to bash the feminists? And of course Diane Abbott came in with her take on this. We know how to solve knife crime and it's not with a fried chicken box. <laughs> Listen, dude, right? If these young people, urban, ethnic, inner city youths, tend to frequent fried chicken shops, that's not anyone's fault. And if that's where they are, then that's where the conservatives have to try and target them to get their attention. Is it not? Diane and David. This is not some kind of riff on black people. This is just what the conservatives need to do to actually speak to young people. There are, of course, much more specific places that inner city youths attend in higher proportions, and of course he doesn't cite any evidence for this idea that chicken shops are a hub for black youth engagement, or whether or not this plan would even work, which I suspect it almost certainly won't. Notice, by the way, that the more he reads directly from the article, the more time is taken up, so he can push the runtime beyond 10 minutes and get that sweet, sweet extra ad revenue. Taking it out would stop him being able to get that optimum monetization. So the government's latest initiative, which involves putting anti-knife crime messages on fried chicken boxes <laughs> is almost cruelly pointless. No, it's probably not. It's probably going to have some effect. It is not as if we no don't know what works when it comes to knife crime. Glasgow has shown the way with the introduction of public health approach. In 2005, the World Health Organization dubbed Glasgow the violent crime capital of Europe and it had the highest per capita level of knife crime in Britain. But the introduction of the public health approach brought down the levels of knife crime sharply and the numbers of people admitted to hospital in, in Glasgow with stabbing injuries has gone right down. Okay. Public health approach involved the police working closely with education, the NHS, social services, and the community. There's also a lot of emphasis on offering young people alternative paths of mentoring. Listen, I know you can't mentor someone with a fried chicken box, but it is at least something, speaking to them on a human level. But it's not enough, is the point. She's suggesting something that works and is much more on a human level than whatever this shit is. What's more on a human level than talking to people like, well, humans? But your solution is just the state. Your solution is bigger state, which is not surprising since you're in part of the Labour Party. The Conservative solution is to appeal to them as humans, as individuals, and say, look, there is actually a better way of life that you can choose. Not necessarily. I mean, it could easily be implemented on a community-focused level, but does anyone really believe that something like the scheme in Glasgow is bad because it's the state doing it? Don't get me wrong, I'm an anarchist and I absolutely believe that the state overstepping its bounds is fundamentally dangerous and destructive, but this is a drop in the ocean next to the massive power the state already has over us. And unlike most of the state's incursions into our lives, like the Snoopers Charter, which the right-wing conservative government introduced, actually has a chance of helping people. Is the NHS bad because of big government too? Fuck off, mate. Many in the community are querying why ministers are putting their messages on fried chicken boxes. What is meant to be the particular relationship between knife crime and fried chicken? I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. It's black people and Sargon is a racist. I am all for innovative methods to reach young people and their parents, but have ministers thought about doing more work with our big urban churches? Well, do gang members go to church? Yes, they do. In fact, there are multiple churches in the UK that have used the influence religion has over young people to help fight knife crime, and it's actually shown some degree of success. Do you get them in there? Should we sit there in, in the pews go, you know what, knives are bad, knives are bad, you shouldn't carry knives? Because I imagine that all of the people in there already agree with that. But not everyone who visits these fried chicken shops agrees with that, Diane. Do you get it? So there are multiple ways to do that, but one of these churches actually uses former gang members and respected members of the community to draw in people who look up to them and encourages their members to outwardly appear prosperous to entice in poor, desperate people who would otherwise have turned to a life of crime. There are lots of ways to go about doing this and they've shown serious results. Some of the most effective knife crime work is being done by community-based projects, operated on shoestrings and run by mums. Yeah, okay, but why aren't they run by dads? Oh, oh right, they're not run by dads because they aren't fucking there, are they? Why does it make a difference who runs them? They're shown to be effective no matter who's in charge. Actually, a number of anti-knife campaigns are run by dads who are worried for their kids' safety, but discovering that would require a quick Google, so too much effort for Sargon to expend, and also he wants to continue to be racist and bang on about this one talking point for literally years. 
This is a failure of the parents from not forming a healthy nuclear family. That's what the problem is here. So why are we not seeing a huge amount of the children of gay parents being criminals? Maybe because this nuclear family bullshit is, well, bullshit. At the very least, instead of spending money on especially printed fried chicken boxes, ministers need to direct that money to those mum-led groups. No! Because single mothers, in fact, are the problem in this regard. Single mothers, I hate to tell you this, are not fathers. Single mothers cannot play the role of the father. What is that role? He keeps going on about this, but never elaborates. Also, again, these programs work, so who gives a fuck who runs them? It just can't be done. It doesn't work. And so the solution is the massive state apparatus that everyone has to pay unbelievable amounts of money for, or trying to talk to these kids as humans and saying, listen, you're going to have to stop stabbing each other. It's really bad for you. Yes, maybe some community engagement program or outreach might be beneficial then, like the ones that already exist and are shown to work but have been thoroughly undermined by Tory budget cuts. Oops. Let's be fair, Diane and David Lammy, every fucking day of your life you get up, you go on Twitter and you go, that's racist. Everything's fucking racist. I haven't seen either of these people do this. I've seen them call racist thugs racist, but if they've called everything racist, then I must have missed that. Can you give an example? However, even though Stop and Search is racist, it still worked, which is why Sadiq Khan's going to adopt it. Stop and Search is being increased to counteract the reduction in police numbers thanks to conservative cuts to the police department. And even though you consider this to be racist, maybe speaking to these kids on a human level, giving accounts of people who have been through this and said, well, look, this was actually terrible, it ruined my life, don't let it ruin yours, maybe that will work too. He keeps saying this on a human level stuff as if it means anything when, let's be honest here, reducing people down to racial stereotypes and talking down to them about how not stabbing people is good actually is dehumanising and insulting, whereas Diane Abbott's suggestions are actually helping on a human level and also have been shown to work. Instead of trying to fit reality to your ideology, why don't we fit our ideology? A lot of sleight of hand rhetorical tricks used there. I didn't point them all out, but I hope you've retained some of them because they might come up again moving forward.